This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Amazon Prime's exclusive Lore. It's a chilling six-episode anthology series from executive producer of The Walking Dead and an executive producer of The X-Files based on the podcast phenomenon with over 70 million downloads. Creator and narrator Aaron Mankey explores the most terrifying tales throughout history, takes a myth that is rooted in historical folklore, and twists it, exposing timeless terrors that still haunt us today. Real life can scare you to death. Watch exclusively on Amazon Prime Video this October, starting on Friday the 13th. This episode of Memory Palace is brought to you by our friends at Article, makers of fine furniture with fantastic industrial and mid-century and Scandinavian designs. Also the makers of The Lamp that is lighting this script as I read it. They have everything you need at Article for your home, including brand new, a whole array of fine leather couches. These are really beautiful, extraordinarily well-made, just like everything they've got. And for $49, they will ship anything, including a large, beautiful leather couch to your front door, regardless of size. And you can get $50 off your first order of $100 or more at article.com slash memory palace. That's article.com slash memory palace. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. The mind would wander. How could it not in the mill? 12, 14 hours a day. Same chattering machines. Chattering co-workers. Same smells. Same flat winter light. Tufts of cotton, flecks of thread, reds and browns and blues, airborne on the cold draft coming through the gap between the window pane and the red brick, the clack and shush of the looms, same rough tug of soft cotton on callous fingers as you built another bolt of cloth, thread by thread, moment by moment, day after day after day after day after. The minds of the women in the mill would wander as their eyes would drift to the window to the low-hanging clouds, to the deer tracks in the snow on the ice and the river that rolls just below and turns the wheel and turns the gears of the loom that you have to get your mind back to right now so the machine doesn't jam, so you don't hurt yourself, so you don't forget for a moment those movements you can feel in your sleep, the rough tug of soft cotton on callous fingers. Yet the mind wouldn't wander and wonder if there was a better life for you Wonder at how the few dollars you'd make in a week made up of days that started hours before dawn and ended hours after sunset would ever add up. Would ever buy you more than a book or a brush, some brief distraction brought home in a paper bag. Wonder how you were ever supposed to meet a man to marry, to take you away from the mill, when all you saw all day were women and men you weren't allowed to speak with, lest your mind start wandering, as it was right now back to the machine, to the chattering and the chattering, day after day, and on and on and on. Margaret Knight's mind would wander. How could it not? She was 12, and new to this mill downriver from Manchester, New Hampshire. Maybe it would wander to her mother, out there in the cold, left to attend to the farm on her own since Margaret's father died. Was it better in here? At least there was the warmth of other bodies in the benches, despite their chattering. At least there were the tufts of cotton, the colored flecks of thread flooring about the room, pretty in their way. But she would have been told by the other girls and women not to let her mind wander, to keep her head down, keep her eyes on her work. Don't worry about the rough tug of soft cotton on soft fingers. The calluses would come, but her mind would wander. Back to school. She loved school. But those days were over now. Back to the wooden toys she would make for herself. The sled she would design and build for her brothers. That they'd all take down the hill by the farm on days like this. Before she came to work in the mill. Her mind would wander. But she was alert enough to see one day. A woman working her loom. And see the shuttle. The metal piece that wove the thread between the warp and the weft. Shoot out across the room and tear into a man's face. And drop him to the ground. She saw him taken away, saw someone clean up the blood, and heard the looms resume their chattering. That night, Margaret's mind wandered, wandered back to the day, to the man on the ground, to the blood on the floor, and the machines whose movement she had come to know so quickly, and whose parts she could picture so clearly, and take a part in her head. 
move them around, understanding intuitively how one was connected to another. What would happen if those connections changed? She could do that. She probably didn't quite realize how rare of a thing it was to be able to do that. For how many people had she met in her 12 years who could? How many people there at the mill would have had a moment to notice it? How many teachers would have thought to cultivate it in New Hampshire in 1850 in a girl? Somehow, though, someone at the mill took Margaret Knight seriously when she came in with a wooden object, an invention she'd come up with when her mind was wandering and caused the machines to stop automatically when something went wrong. And somehow, her device became standard in all looms for decades to come. Not that Margaret Knight profited from it, and it is easy to guess why. Her family likely knew nothing of patents, of what those numbers meant on those machines Margaret could take apart in her head. Margaret certainly hadn't been taught about them. She was a girl. History loses track of this girl in the mill. It finds her again as a woman, about 28 years old, working in a paper bag factory in Springfield, Massachusetts. It tells us little about how she spent the years between. It tells us nothing about how it felt to see all those looms outfitted with the safety device of her design, or if her mind ever wandered to wonder about the money some man had made selling it to all those mill owners while she herself was turning hours of her life into pennies and slowly stitching them into dollars. But even without the benefit of the historical record, I can fairly safely tell you what she did during all those lost years. She worked. And in 1867, she spent nearly every hour of nearly every day folding and gluing and cutting paper. Or just folding. Or folding and cutting, but not gluing. History doesn't seem to have written down precisely what went down in the Columbia Paper Bag Factory of Springfield, Massachusetts. But we know the rules were the same as they had been in the textile mill. Keep your head down. Don't let your mind wander. And we know she couldn't help it. For two years, Margaret Knight's mind would wander to a single idea, a machine with gears and cranks. She'd put the pieces together in her head while she sat and folded and or glued and or cut. She'd turn it around, reassemble the pieces, try it again. And at night or at lunch, she'd take a pencil and paper, there was certainly plenty of paper around, and put the idea down. The foreman of the mill complained, told her to keep her head down and keep her mind on her work. But at home, she took some wood and took that idea, a paper bag-making machine, and built it in miniature. And then she sent it off to a machinist in Boston to make a model with tiny gears that when turned could turn a tiny sheet of paper into a tiny paper bag. But when she went to send the model and her drawings and application to the patent office, she was told not to bother. An identical machine had already been submitted and was about to be approved. So Margaret went to a lawyer and they figured out that a man in the machine shop had seen her model and was so impressed that he made his own and passed it off as his own. The lawyer also told her that it would cost her $100 a day to take this to patent court. He may well have pointed out that that was as much as 10 times as she made in a week. But Margaret Knight had spent her life working at jobs she couldn't have liked, keeping her head down, being told not to let her mind, that remarkable mind of hers, wander, turning hours into pennies, and stitching them into dollars. What would she spend it on, if not this? So for 16 days, in $1,600, Margaret Knight fought for her patent number. The argument of the man who stole her design was that it had to be his design, as he was a he. This was a complicated, ingenious machine beyond the intellectual capacity of any woman. Never mind a woman who folded and or cut and or glued paper bags for a living. Well, Margaret White took the stand, showed the patent judge her notes, showed them her wooden model, told him how it all worked, told him how perhaps only a woman who had folded and cut and glued paper bags all day every day would be so driven to invent a machine that would free her from the folding and the cutting and the gluing. 
and she won and was issued patent number 116,842. The first American patent issued to a woman in the 19th century. She licensed her device to a paper bag company in Connecticut for $2,500 and for $25,000 in royalties. It was enough to pay her legal bills, but more importantly, it was enough to let her mind wander. When the New York Times caught up with her in 1913, she was 70 years old and happily at work at her 89th invention. She would die the next year. Historians aren't quite sure whether that number is accurate, the 89 inventions. Some suggest it could have been many more. She appears to have patented 22 of them. An automatic tool for boring or planing cylindroidal surfaces. An internal combustion engine. A rotary engine. A skirt protector. People note that she never married. Okay. Maybe she didn't want to. Maybe she never found the right man. One who could fit into this life that she was inventing for herself. Maybe it wasn't a man she wanted at all. The one thing we're sure of is that she didn't need one. People also note the mere $300 she had to her name at the time of her death. And note the distinction between the estate of a woman the papers called the female Thomas Edison and that of the male Thomas Edison. But I will note that she may not have needed a fortune, with no heirs, in a nice home in a nice neighborhood, with space in which to create, and time for her mind to wander. <laughs> 